All you need is a light source and two spheres. On the right, I'll be showing video footage of past lunar eclipses that we are all familiar with. And on the left, I will be showing what a shadow moving over a sphere actually looks like. A lunar eclipse is not, I repeat, is not a shadow of a sphere or anything else circular moving across a spherical object. How do I know? There are four critical points of observation everyone should be looking at. And I like to call these the confirmation to surface factor, the shadow diffusion factor, the sine wave or S factor, and the reflected light factor. Firstly, I would like to point out the consistency of how a shadow naturally moves along varied surface types. This is the confirmation factor. A shadow will conform to any shape that the surface takes, thus, in a way, revealing the true shape of an object. If a shadow moves along something rigid like stairs, it will take the stairs shape, revealing the level differential from step to step. If a shadow moves along a concave object like a bowl, the shadow will stretch and skew, revealing the concavity of the bowl. If a shadow was to move over the surface of a sphere, it would stretch and skew in a spherical manner, wrapping and receding as it bevels and distorts along the sphere's surface. Note that this does not and has never happened on the surface of the moon during an eclipse. Which brings us to our next factor, the shadow diffusion factor. Note the shadow is more crisp on the edge of the bowl than it is in the lowest portion of the bowl and sharpens as it rises back up to the edge or the source of the shadow. Note also that on a sphere the shadow is most diffused or scattered around the edges as the sphere's surface recedes, and it is the most sharp or defined on the closest portion of the sphere. This is because the closer the source of the shadow is to the surface, the more defined its edges. The further the source of the shadow is from the surface, the larger and more faded or diffused it becomes. Another way to say this is if you place an object on a surface with a light source above, the object's shadow will appear most sharp when the object is at rest. But lift the object closer to its light source and you will see the shadow lose its crisp edges and dull or fade away sometimes to the point where little to no shadow remains. This is the shadow diffusion factor, and in conjunction with the first factor, the confirmation to the surface factor, the shadow not only rises and falls, stretches and skews with the surface, but also sharpens and dulls. These two factors are almost all we need to find the true topography or shape of the moon. Yet one factor is missing. This is called the sine wave factor, or S factor. Because the moon is said to be a sphere, the shadow that is projected onto the moon should also take on the characteristics of the sphere. This critical factor does not appear on the moon's eclipses whatsoever. The sine wave factor, or the S factor, is what happens as an object, round or straight, spherical or bent, passes over a sphere's surface. As the shadow moves onto a sphere, it is wrapping around its curve. Starting from the outer edge and moving towards the middle, the shadow takes on the spherical contour and bends upward at its height, then falls backwards in a barrel distorted manner. The shadow will always follow the closest edge due to perspective. The shadow will continue to create the S shape until it reaches the halfway point. As the shadow moves beyond the halfway point, it begins to bevel outward again in a barrel distortion manner. When a shadow moves along a 3D sphere, the center or closest part of the sphere to the observer is the most flat and the shadow's shape and size the most true to life. The sphere will never be flat, but the bigger the sphere is, the less acute the angle of its curvature. So, because the innermost portion of the sphere 
is the closest to the observer, the less curvature is observed. However, when we observe any lunar eclipse, there is no wrapping, stretching, skewing, sharpening or dulling of the shadow. In fact, every single lunar eclipse looks as if there is one flat disk moving across another flat disk. As the circular shadow moves along the moon, it maintains its circular shape the whole way at the same pace. No stretching, no skewing, no sharpening or dulling. Hopefully you all understood that, as it was quite hard for me to put into words. Those three factors are good enough for us to see that the moon is not a sphere, but one factor is needed to realize the moon's surroundings, and that's reflected light. When another object under the same light source is in close proximity of the object in question, i.e. the moon, it should have light bouncing off of the earth and reflecting onto the moon. When another object under the same light source is in close proximity of the object in question, it should have light bouncing off and reflecting onto it. What I mean is this. The closer another object comes to the sphere, the brighter the light it's reflecting will appear. In the made-up heliocentric lie, they tell us that the moon is reflecting the light to the earth. But what about the bigger object, the earth? Does it reflect and bounce light to the moon? It should, but it doesn't. Because if it did, we would then have no new moon phase, and instead more of a dull moon phase, or a dim moon phase. Meaning, as the moon wanes to darkness, it should then be illuminated by the earth. We should still be able to see the same face of the moon that we see every day, because the moon is always facing us. However, it should be dimmer and not luminous because the earth should reflect its massive light towards the dark moon, especially when the moon is further and closer to the earth on its supposed elliptical path. It should brighten and dim in its new moon phase. I repeat, speaking exclusively from new moon to new moon, the moon itself should still be visible on that new moon phase, transitioning from dim to slightly brighter, back to dim, as the moon moves in its elliptical orbit. The object also should reflect the color of its surface and the color of its light source. A gold chain will reflect gold, a green ball will bounce green light, and its reflection on the object will be green. The sun's light is yellow or warm, while the moon's light is blue and cool. Astronauts say the moon is black and white, whatever that means. But if that means it's a scale of grays running from white to black, then it is impossible for the moon to change the sun's light from a warm color and temperature to a cool color and temperature. Yes, the moon's light is colder than the moon's shade. I can understand the moon cooling down the sun's rays and making it less hot, but in no way is it possible for it to actually make the sun's rays colder than the shade at night. Meaning, if you stepped into the moonlight at night, the temperature of the sun's rays reflecting off the surface of the moon and onto your face or thermometer should be greatly reduced, but not colder than if there was no moon at all. When the moon comes out at night, the temperature drops because of the moon's light. This has been confirmed by many experiments using digital thermometers. But staying on course, there is no sign of a reflected light being thrown onto the moon by Earth. What does this mean? This means that the new moon has actually disappeared. While the moon is waxing and waning, we can see the rest of the moon that is not illuminated. However, when there is a new moon, or no sunlight being reflected, we do not see a dim spherical object traversing our sky. In fact, in the daytime, we should still see a dim object traversing the sky, but we have never seen either of these things in our realities. Can you ever remember seeing a dim, non-luminous moon 
high in the sky at the new moon phase? I repeat, at the new moon phase, not while it's waxing or waning, and not when it's near full. Have you ever seen a dim, non-luminous moon high in the sky at the new moon phase? Now that this information is being brought to light, you will never be able to help but notice something you've never noticed before. That on an eclipse, the shadow has never stretched along the surface of a spherical moon. No stretching, no skewing, no sharpening in or fading away. Not obscured and distorted in sine wave-like motions. No light reflecting onto the moon from Earth. Nothing. Not a single shred of evidence remains that the moon is a spherical body orbiting around or above our Earth. This 100% discounts and debunks any further argument or perspectives that hold to our moon being a sphere in the sky or reflecting the sun's light. This information is in line with the laws of the reflector. The reflector can only reflect light brilliantly if the surface of the reflector is concave, but the outside of the sphere is convex, and convex surfaces only reflect a portion of the light back to the viewer's eye. But a concave surface reaccumulates the spreading light or reconcentrates the light back to the observer's eye, whereas the convex surface, like the surface of a ball, further scatters the light. If the moon were over 250,000 miles away, then we would only see a portion of the moon, which we would call the hot spot or the bright spot or the highlight of the sphere. But there are no hot spots or highlights or bright points on the sphere of the moon indicating the sun's direction. Instead, we have a perfectly evenly lit luminescent moon that gives us cold blue light. In fact, when we look at a full moon, it appears to be flat because the edges of the moon are just as bright as the center or any other part on a full moon. Now that your eyes are opened to the physics and the facts, what will you do? Will you choose to continue believing this lie or observe it for yourself? Anybody can do it. Just go outside and look up. And in case you're wondering about what Neil deGrasse Tyson has to say on the matter, just look how he debunked himself. He went on social media, yes, supposedly the world's leading astrophysicist, anyway, went on social media and posted this ridiculous photo of what he thinks the shadow of a flat Earth would look like on the moon. Now, of course, he believes that the moon is a sphere, or at least that's what he says. But if that's the case, then why is there no stretching or skewing of this shadow? Once again, it goes to show you how important it is to be observant and to rely on your own senses. It also displays the innate sense for acute observation to a true artist. We have to combine both worlds, science and spirituality, the abstract 